Uh, you want to do more walking than running, but if you walk every day, you're going to tend to speed up the healing because it's all about blood flow. And you bring blood flow into the muscles when you walk, and yet you don't cause damage by walking. Uh, wear compression uh, sleeves on the calf muscle. Calf muscle is the leading uh, driver of running, and so you really want to help it recover and uh, putting a calf sleeve, not just when you do your walks every day, but throughout the day, is going to help circulation in the calf muscle, which is then gonna help that calf muscle recover. Um, and uh, restrain your enthusiasm from running fast for two to three weeks. You, you, a lot of people can start right back running uh, within two or three days if you have the right run, walk, run. But to run too fast can be a deal killer and uh, often causes a high rate of injury. So now is the fun part, and that is any questions. Can I help you with any of your running problems or nutrition related to running? Uh, any questions? Any, any problems that, uh, yes. The question is, and I get this a lot, what effort should you be putting into the run portion? And I also get the question, what type of speed should you have on a walk? Let me start with that. The walk break should be gentle enough so that you recover from the run. Uh, and and it really, will, you will recover from the run if you take the walk break right from the beginning and uh, you start soon enough. For example, if you're running a pace that is a 10 minute per mile pace, then between 60 and 90 seconds into that run, take a 30 second walk break. You would be amazed at how great you feel when you start up. And this is the biggest surprise that I hear from people who start using run, walk, run. If they use the walk breaks from the beginning, they feel so darn good when they run on, on every running cycle because you're erasing the fatigue. You feel so good that you actually have a tendency to run too fast. So you've got to sort of pedal it back a little bit. Uh, the good news is that there are a lot of good GPS devices out there now that you can put on average pace. And after the first quarter mile, half mile, you can tell what pace you're on and then that will help you judge the effort level of the running that you have. Uh, caution on walking, you don't want to have a long walking stride. That is a source of injury, so uh, keep the uh, walk stride relatively gentle. Why does the run-walk-run method work? Well, first of all, you're going back to the way your body was designed. It was designed to run non-stop. And when you run non-stop, you use up your resources at an extremely fast pace. And you don't have those resources available at the end, so you slow down a little. And that's where that 15 minutes of time improvement comes. Because run-walk-run, you have the resiliency in the muscle. So how does the uh, run, walk, run keep the injuries uh, away? Well, injuries come on because you're irritating weak links. And the weak links are irritated dramatically more by running. And they're hardly ever irritated by walking. So it's the running portion that causes the injuries in a running program. If you change up your run, walk, run strategy so that you're heavy on the walking side, most people who are injured can run through the injuries, but you have to adjust it and see how it works. Um, but uh, by uh, finding the right strategy for run, walk, run from the beginning, you take that stress buildup away so that the uh, irritated area doesn't develop an injury, or if the injury has occurred, you can stay below that threshold uh, so that it will heal.
I don't know what the high intensity interval uh, in, uh, training program is, uh, but uh, run walk run is just extremely simple. Walking is what we were designed to do. And if we run at a pace that is comfortable for us, and we put a walk break in early and often, we keep erasing the fatigue and the buildup of stress. Uh, intensity though, and I don't know what that method is, but I, if it is fast running, then you're gonna put a whole lot of stress on your weak links and on your muscles and you're gonna wear them out soon. But I don't know how that's done, but watch out if you're run, whenever you're running intense. Stretching? Okay. Uh, very simply, I am going to absolve you, my children, of all guilt from never stretching again. Uh, believe it or not, I have studied this extensively, and so have my orthopedic consultants, and none of us have ever found a study anywhere in the world showing that stretching has any benefit at all for distance running. However, there are quite a few studies showing negative effects on distance runners by stretching. So without any benefits, a lot of bad stuff, don't stretch. <laughs> the question uh, and supposition is that using run, walk, run, you can hopefully increase your distance more quickly than you would if you were running. That's very definitely true because you're, you continue to erase the stress buildup and you erase the fatigue level so that the muscles recover so much faster. Uh, now, I'll tell you um, one of the common concerns that Barb and I have at the Disney races I'm the official training consultant for the Run Disney series, and I'm at the expo, at every one of their expos, uh, practically every single hour of the day. And there is usually a line of people, one after another, 10 to 12 hours a day. They're coming up with this, that, and the other. And a lot of it is wonderful stuff in that they are telling me how well this thing has worked, and they've lost 100 pounds, 150 pounds. We hear from dozens every Disney race who have lost over 100 pounds. Uh, and they, it was all related to run, walk, run because they tried to run and they couldn't do it. But run, walk, run, they just kept burning it off. Now, here's something that I don't want any of you to do that a lot of the Disney people do. They have the best intentions of doing the training, but they come up to me and they say, you know, I've got a problem here. I really didn't get in hardly any of the training rooms. And so the bottom line is regularly at the half marathons, they will have run no more than, than four to six months. And, and they're planning on doing this. And they have to maintain 16 minutes a mile, which is, wouldn't have been tough for them if they had trained. Uh, but the bottom line is, I ask them first, if I tell you that, that you should not run tomorrow, are you going to listen to me? Well, you can probably imagine, almost every single one of them will say, I won't listen to you, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to go for that metal and give it a shot. So then I have to back up in my mind and say, do I really want them to be hurt and discouraged and maybe never run again. So what I do then is give them a suggestion on run, walk, run based on what their training has been. And uh, again, the default is mostly walking. And so I have them mostly walking. And then if the, uh, if the balloon ladies are approaching, and the balloon ladies in the Disney races are just the uh, the, the, the people who warn you that you're about to get picked up. Uh, they carry these big Mickey Mouse balloons, and so you know who they are. 
And you look, they, these characters I'm talking about are looking behind and looking over their shoulders. Uh, and when they see them, then uh, usually running five seconds, seven, or ten seconds, and walking 30 seconds has been the way that most of them have stayed ahead of the balloon ladies. And surprisingly, there have been a number who were, got picked up when they were using 10 seconds run and 30 seconds walk. But when they dropped down to five and seven, they stayed ahead of the balloon ladies. It, it's really interesting. The shorter segments allow people to run faster. And therefore, the overall pace ends up being faster. A lot of counterintuitive things are going on in the world. Yes? In my first book, I also, in the beginning chapter, had walk breaks that we used, and, uh, and that was the first incursion into doing it. Um, the gliding we still use, as a matter of fact, one of the tools that we have really developed and teach at our running retreats, which we hold regularly on the Panhandle of Florida, between Destin and Panama City, is this beautiful place to run called Point Washington State Park, or Blue Mountain Beach. Um, but uh, we teach these drills, and one of them is an acceleration ladder drill. And the way it works is you um, would walk for, as if you were on a walk break, and then you ease gently into a shuffle, and ease gently into a slow jog, and then uh, a regular pace jog, and then a very slight acceleration to five to seven steps, followed by a glide, which is simply coasting off your momentum back into another walk break. And this drill has been very beneficial in uh, allowing people to learn how to transition so that there's no abrupt change between running and walking and, uh, and, and running again. Uh, so anyway, that is still alive and well. And by doing four to eight of these drills once a week, you get better and better and better. And the other benefit is you can use these drills in a race if you're starting to slow down. It'll pick your rhythm right back up. The other drill, by the way, is the cadence drill. And, and that's based on 75 years of research in, uh, in bioengineering running in which it shows that as distance runners get faster, their stride length actually shortens. So it's actually cadence uh, increase that can help you get faster. And so on that drill, it's a 15 or a 30 second drill. And you would count the number of times that your left or your right foot touched. Uh, and we have these beeping timers now. We call them the little green coach. Uh, it's, it's, you may have seen some of them in races, but uh, they beep and vibrate so that you don't have to look at your watch to do this drill. And then after you've gotten a count on the first one, your target on the second one is to get one more count. And then on the next one, another count. And over the span of six months, you get more efficient and a little faster as a result of those drills. Question is, do we incorporate uh, any speed work only for those that want to improve their time? And, uh, you know, years ago, back in the 70s and 80s, everybody wanted to improve their time. The reality today is only about 20% of the running population wants to improve their time. And speed work actually causes injuries. And it's, it's right up there with long runs is the highest rate of injury. Uh, but we do include some components uh, of improvement in each day. So three days a week are what we found to be necessary to continue improvement. The weekend is either a long run or on an alternate. Uh, long runs only need to be done every two weeks. Uh, and once the long run reaches 16 miles, you can move it up to every three weeks. And once you do a 26 miler, you can move it to four weeks. And then on the off weekends, you could have a race, you could have a, a speed workout if you're training for the half or the full marathon, 
or you can just have an enjoyable run. Uh, come and join us on the Panhandle and, and enjoy that. But uh, the bottom line, uh, with the days of the week, on Tuesday, we will have a, an easy warm-up, followed by four to eight of the drills, each one of the drills. And then it's our pace day. So you have a pace that you'd like to hit, or a pace that can keep you ahead of the balloon ladies, or something like that. Uh, so you run quarter mile or half mile repetitions at the pace that you need to maintain in your race. And you take a three minute walk in between each one. And the other thing we do with those uh, repetitions is we try a different run, walk, run strategy on each one. So every week you're doing four to six different configurations and you'll come up with ones that just simply work better. Uh, for example, someone that's running 11 or 12 minutes per mile uh, would be shooting for a 60 second, 30 second, or a 40, 20, or a 45, 30, or a 45, 25. There are a whole bunch of things that you can try. And, uh, and interestingly enough, uh, I wanted to qualify for Boston five years ago, you know, after the Boston bombing. And uh, I hadn't qualified for 10 years. So I went back into training, didn't know if I could qualify, quite honestly. I hadn't done any speed work in 10 years. Uh, but I found through trial and error that uh, the pace that I needed, uh, which is I was 68 years old, at the time it was uh, 9.33 per mile, uh, I could achieve that by running 30 seconds and walking 15. And that's how I qualified. I, I ran 30 seconds and walked 15. And uh, it was wonderful. Uh, never got uh, beat up. The Thursday workout is an easy run followed by four each of the drills and then some hills. And hills build strength. Uh, over here. I'm not familiar with oxygen. No. So just beware. You're not going to lose much anyway. 
but you gain so much more in the resiliency of those muscles when you start up again. So, you know, all I can say is you've got to try it. Practically everybody I know at your pace that's tried it comes back to me and says, I see what you mean. So give it a try. you are running a certain amount and walking a certain amount, it is the run, walk, run method. It's all run, walk, run. What I'm giving you tonight is the latest research on what will benefit you, for more people anyway, based on the pace per mile. So what pace per mile are you wanting to run? Dancing is not a great idea when you're coming back from an injury. Uh, bottom line is that it's best to warm up very gently for 10 minutes. So I would start out with nothing more than 30 seconds, 30 seconds for 10 minutes. And then you can ease into it depending on how you feel. If you set your timer for 30 seconds and 30 seconds, then when you start to feel good and warmed up, you can do two of the 30 seconds in a long line. And then later on, you can do three of them. Just go to Jeff, jeffgalloway.com. Over there, yes sir. The question is about shoes and how should you change up shoes or should you change up shoes and you're going to, as in any topic in running and in life, you're going to see a whole lot of different opinions out there. So I'm going to give you mine <laughs> and mine is, is not just based on what I thought of on my run this morning, but it's based on having been in the shoe business since 1973 and having fitted tens of thousands of people early on and then hearing shoe problems from people every day of the year. Uh, I'm not going to try to sell you shoes. I'm going to say that uh, the best advice is to get the best advice. Uh, and so you want to try to find somebody that has the most experience and has helped more people in, in getting the shoe that works for the type of foot you have. There are two dimensions of shoe fitting. The first one is the shape of your foot, but before that, you need to find a shoe that satisfies the function of your foot. And there tend to be two basic types of shoe, of foot function. One of them is a straightforward, rigid foot, and the other one is a floppy foot has more mobility there. And so you need to get a shoe that uh, accommodates the type of foot you have. Uh, a lot of the neutral shoes today are gonna work for both, but uh, the best way to find out whether it'll work for you is to find somebody that really knows their stuff about shoes. Now, all of that said, if you have a pair of shoes that's working for you and you're not having any trouble with it, then go ahead and use them. The only downside is that about every six to nine months, six to nine months, the shoe companies change them up and uh, drives us all crazy. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions on that, you can call my store, Fidipides, in Atlanta, and uh, we'll uh, we'll give you the best advice we can. If you if you have a shoe that you're not having any trouble with. Stay with it.
you explain, you mean like the beginning of the race? Absolutely. Uh, the whole, the, the first walk break will give you more benefit than any other walk break. Because you can erase all the fatigue buildup so far by taking that first walk break seconds into the running. And if you keep doing that, you keep erasing fatigue. If you wait a mile or three miles, you have that much uh, fatigue that you'll never get rid of. But the run, walk, run in the beginning will allow you to keep erasing that. The other way of looking at it, if there is a section of the race that helps you more in running nonstop, it is always at the end of the race, not the beginning of the race. If you run nonstop at the beginning, you're going to have more problems. Wait and run at the end and pass tons of people. I got wonderful education at Florida State, and I was very excited to be able to use some of that education and understanding Jeff's Run, Walk, Run. And I think I've, I've explained it to some people, and they're like, well, why didn't we just say that? So what it is is this. He keeps talking about fatigue in the Run, Walk, Run. What it does is it modulates the way your body uses the available glycogen. So when you burn glycogen, which is our stored muscles, stored muscle energy. You burn, when you burn it, you, you build up lactic acid. It's released into your bloodstream. Lactic acid is not a, a good um, thing to have in your bloodstream while you're trying to continue to run. So by modulating that burn of the glycogen, you take a walk break and you switch over to fat for just a few seconds. It doesn't take long. That's how we found that the 30 seconds is the kind of the key. If you walk for 30 seconds, it's long enough to switch over to fat for a few seconds so that you stop burning the glycogen. And you have that glycogen available to you later on in the race. So that's why when we say you have it available, that, that, that builds up the fatigue, it's the lactic acid that is filling your bloodstream and you can't carry as much oxygen in your bloodstream. So that's why. That um, it sometimes uh, makes it a little clearer as to why you have more energy at the end of the race. And it's very important to take those walk breaks at the beginning because that is when you can stop that buildup of lactic acid. The more you can stop the buildup, the more you have it, the longer you can run. And it makes it possible to run marathons once a month when you use only 15 seconds of glycogen with 15 seconds of fat. And that is another historical lesson that was learned at the campus of Florida State University.